Hey, Bethlehem First, we want to welcome you to our Holy Week devotionals. We'll be releasing these each day this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and it's going to culminate in our Good Friday service at the end of the week. What we wanted to do as part of these devotionals is remind you how in, during the season of Advent, we light candles. Uh, each candle represents a different theme for Advent, love, hope, joy, and peace. And that culminates on Christmas Eve when we light the Christ candle, representing how the light of the world, Jesus Christ, has been born in our lives. This year during Lent, as we journey towards the cross, we're going to be extinguishing candles. So during each one of our devotionals this week, we'll be putting a candle out, reminding us how our sin separates from God. And ultimately, when Jesus died on the cross on Good Friday, how the light that God had sent into the world had been extinguished. And so we hope this is a meaningful event for you as we remember the sacrifices that were made for us. But we also remember that the light is always going always to overcome the darkness and how on Easter morning Jesus rose from the grave and his light still shines brightly in our lives today. Usually God holds back his anger over our sins, but one time he let it loose so we would know how serious it is to turn our backs away from God and toward sin and darkness, so we would know how great his wrath is against sin. But he did not totally destroy his creation. He always shows mercy, and this time he showed his mercy through Noah. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humanity was great on the earth, and he saw that everything that they thought or imagine was constantly and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry that he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. And the Lord said, I will wipe out this human race that I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, I will destroy every living thing, all the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, and even the birds of the sky. I'm sorry that I ever made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on the earth at that time, and he walked in close fellowship with God. Now God saw that the earth has become corrupt and was filled with violence. God observed all this corruption and in the world, for everyone on earth was corrupt. So God said to Noah, I have decided to destroy all living things, for they have filled the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them all out along with the earth. But I want you to build a large ark from cypress wood and waterproof it with tar inside and out. Look, I am about to cover the earth with a flood that will destroy every living thing that breathes. Everything on the earth will die. But I will confirm my covenant with you. So enter the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring a pair of every kind of animal, a male and a female, into the ark. You and keep them alive during the flood. So Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded. For 40 days, the flood waters grew deeper, covering the ground and lifting the ark high above the earth. As the waters rose higher and higher above the ground, the ark floated safely on the surface of the water. All the living things on the earth died. God wiped out every living thing on earth, people, livestock, small animals, and the birds of the sky. All were destroyed. The only people who survived were Noah and those with him on the ark. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock with him on the ark. And God sent a wind to blow across the earth, and the floodwaters began to recede. So Noah and his wife and their sons and their wives left the boat, along with all the large and small animals and birds. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and there he sacrificed burnt offerings to the Lord. And the Lord was pleased with the aroma of the sacrifice and said to himself, I will never again curse the ground because of the human race, even though everything they think or imagine is bent toward evil from childhood. I will never again destroy all living things. As long as the earth remains, there will be planting and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you and for all generations. I have set my bow in the clouds. And it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Let us pray. Lord, on this Monday of Holy Week, we're reminded at your anger against our sins. It was revealed in the story of Noah and in Jesus' cleansing of the temple and his cursing of the fig tree. 
Father, forgive us when we turn from you and give in to our own sinful desires that cause us to live for ourselves and fail to produce the fruit that you call us to produce in our lives. Forgive us, we pray, and free us for joyful obedience. As we begin this journey towards the cross, open our eyes to our sins that we may repent, turn from our sinful ways and desires, and live into the covenant of love, grace, mercy, hope, and peace that you provide for us. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear and raise my fear. Really, how precious did that grace appear? The hour I first believed. Following his arrival in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, Jesus returned Sunday night to Bethany, the village at the foot of Mount Olives. Whether he spent the night in a house of Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus in town or in the open air is uncertain. It's most likely he stayed with friends, for that was his normal custom when he visited Jerusalem. As Jesus returned on Monday to Jerusalem, he noticed a fig tree that had produced leaves ahead of season. Jesus knew that fig trees bear fruit twice a year in June and September. This was April, so even the unripened fruit should have still remained for him to eat. It wouldn't have been as good. It would have been something. But since the fig tree bore leaves, Jesus expected to find figs, yet it was fruitless. So Jesus cursed the tree, and it withered the next day. But that's a story for tomorrow. Let's look at the events of Monday. In Mark 11:12 12 through 19, Jesus curses a fig tree and clears the temple courts. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And he taught... And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. Jesus returns to the city of Jerusalem on Monday to reap the fruits of Palm Sunday. He's been proclaimed the Messiah by the crowds, and they should be waiting for him, so he has expectations of them. But his efforts to open their hearts to God have not borne fruit. Two significant events take place on Monday of Holy Week. First, Jesus encounters the poor barren fig tree. Being hungry, he looks for fruit but finds none, so he curses the tree. May no one ever eat from you again. Second, Jesus encounters the spiritual emptiness of the temple. Exploitation, corruption, greed, and theft are sanctioned by the temple priests. Jesus drives the money changers away, upsets their tables and chairs, and stops people from carrying good into the temple. We have troubles with these verses. This is not the gentle Jesus, meek and mild. This is an angry Jesus, indignant and wild. We, of course, want to see Jesus as loving and gentle because we want to be the recipients of that love and gentleness. Doesn't the Bible tell us that God is eager to forgive our sins? Why didn't Jesus forgive the fig tree? Why is he so violent with the money changers? 
What does that say about the way God will deal with us? The fig tree usually produces its fruit in the fall, but there's an early fig that may come with the first blush of spring. Usually these fruits fall off or are blown away and never ripen, but when they do ripen, they are highly prized for their excellent flavor. It is spring, so Jesus was expecting to find something special, but this poor tree had no fruit. The nation of Israel had failed to exercise their faith in Jesus. They were professing to be fruitful and faithful, waving palm leaves as he entered the city, yet the Jewish people were fruitless, non-productive, and practicing their faith. Within a few days of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, they would deny their king and crucify him. How often are we like the fig tree and fail to bear the fruit Jesus expects in our lives? We say and believe the right things, but our actions are fruitless. We fail to bear the fruit he expects. Another event of Holy Monday is the cleansing of the temple. Jesus had been to the temple before. He had seen the money changers and their greed before, but he expected them to be doing something different in this holy season. This might be, where, this might be a season where Jesus expects something different from us in the midst of our social distancing and isolation. Maybe we can look for opportunities to do something different during this season of separation and seclusion. John 2, 13 through 17 tells us Jesus' first cleansing of the temple when he presented himself as the Messiah. This first cleansing was for teaching and rebuking. This second cleansing occurred during Jesus' final week before his crucifixion. As part of prophecy, Jesus pronounced a symbolic judgment upon the irreverence for the Lord's house of prayer. Possibly the 30-minute journey from Bethany to Jerusalem provided Jesus the time to reflect how the city had changed. In the past two years, some had forgotten whose house the temple was. Commercialism and greed had altered the character of the temple. Currency used to purchase sacrifices was subject to extortion. Jesus chose to clean out the temple one last time. In righteous indignation, he who comes in the name of the Lord overturned the money changers' tables and benches in the outer courts of the Gentiles. How often have we been like the money changers and focused more on our own agendas going about life as usual, trying to get all we can to get ahead, oblivious to the fact that Jesus has expectations for our lives. These two stories reveal the fact that there are times in our lives where God expects more of us than we might be prepared to give. There are times, opportunities, when we can produce our best fruit, times when our efforts are magnified by God's power, and we can accomplish more than we ever could expect to on our own. We can bear rich, delicious fruit for God's kingdom. Fruit in the Bible represents faithfulness. He is the vine and we are the branches. Jesus expects us to bear fruit. Jesus expects us to be faithful at all times, taking advantage of every opportunity to bear fruit for his kingdom. If God cannot count on us to deliver fruit at such times when the opportunity presents itself, then we too might find ourselves subject to his condemnation. Jesus expects us to bear delicious fruit in our lives by living out our faith. Even in times of social distancing and isolation, even in stressful and anxious times, he expects our lives to bear fruit, not just in the spring and summer of life, but in the fall and winter as well. We're to remain faithful and bear fruit. He has come so that we might have life more abundantly at all times. If we're satisfied with a more meager, less productive life, fruitless life, focused on our own agendas and getting the most we can out of life, then we have robbed God of his gift to us. And as the fig tree and money changers can attest, we will know the curse of Jesus. And just like he did with the money changers in the temple, when God looks at our lives, he, may he remove anything that doesn't line up with his will. May he shake up our lives, flip over the tables and chairs to get our attention that we, we might live faithfully for him, seeking always to fulfill his will and expectations. Let us pray. Dear Lord, have mercy on us, for in all reality, our lives deserve your rejection and your curse, but we beg for your blessings. We have always had the best of intentions in our faith life, but the worst achievements. We've been given a million opportunities to bear fruit for you, but have only tried a few times. We have heard so many weeping hearts and painful lives, but offered little to help. Lord, as you did with the money changers, remove anything from our lives that does not line up with your desires and expectations. Nurture us, Lord, that we might bear delicious fruit for you. Give us the courage to try again and again to bear witness to our love for you. Jesus, 
Fill the branches of our lives with fruit that our lives may witness to your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun, we will know less days to see God's praise. Then away.